class is a bit of a mixture between a tutorial and a regular class. I will start off with some last theory, about five minutes of theory derivation, which will be the last bit that we need to wrap the project. Uh, and get a few minutes and get the last class. Uh, after that, feel free to do this if you're comfortable with using MATLAB, if you're comfortable understanding how to trust parameters around the functions. You're comfortable with recognizing why you have set up on keys. You're comfortable with on profiles. Because then the rest of the class should be a waste of time in that. So if you're at that stage, uh, feel free to, to go after we cover this next section. So let's, uh, let's start where we left off last class. And then uh, we'll go to that. So we have this diagram up on the board where we said if I find my reactor here, and I've got a certain flow coming in of A, A naught, and it's entering at its edge of T zero. If we consider a slice of the reactor over here where we have a volume of delta V, so this point over here is B, this point over here is B plus delta V, that length over there is delta L. And we have leaving the reactor at flow F of every species J, and we also have that at temperature T. We derived in a previous class that the temperature uh, through this reactor is given by the T over dV. So this is notice here I'm in the volume coordinates, and I'm going to iterate from 0 to capital V at the end. We could write that as follows. If the rate of reaction of species Ra multiplied by the heat of reaction delta hrt. So it's the heat of reaction, the negative heat of reaction, at a particular temperature t. So we have to know which temperature we are at to calculate that heat of reaction multiplied by the rate. The rate is a function of temperature, the heat of reaction is a function of temperature. So both those terms there are temperature dependent. We have also heat exchange taking place with the ambient temperature. So somewhere out here I have T subscript A, the ambient temperature, and there's heat being transferred there with this heat transfer coefficient U, the area per unit volume A, so that's not U subscript A, it's U times A, so let's emphasize that. U times A, and then it's the temperature minus T ambient. Divided through by a fairly significant, uh, uh, just a, a summation of a denominator terms of the sum of the flows of the jade species multiplied by the heat density. So that's where we were last time, and I emphasized that this first term in that expression in the numerator is the heat released by reaction. What you'll see in Fogler's textbook is that we call this term over here QG heat generated. We had a bit of a discussion on that last time. We said, or last time, we said if delta HR for an exothermic reaction will be negative, a negative times a negative, which is positive, minus RA will be a positive term. So this total term here will be positive, releasing heat into the System. Double check your sign conventions always. If heat is released into the system, that implies that dt by dv will be positive, increasing the temperature as we move through the reactor from left to right. Similarly, here for the heat transfer, if my temperature inside the reactor T exceeds Ta, the ambient temperature, I have heat leaving the system. So T minus TA is positive, heat is leaving the system, multiplied by the positive, multiplied by the positive, then the negative, just will reduce heat out of the system. 
system, making my profile drop off. So the signs are consistent here. So that term over there is QG generated over for this QR to the remove. So that was, that was the situation last class, and we also had a bit of a discussion then on what happens in packed bed reactor. So that's called our flow reactor. In a packed bed reactor, we change our coordinates to delta, and we have this relationship that dW is equal to the camera's density rho v times dB. So it's a straightforward substitution in there for dB to get the instrument of dW. And let's just emphasize that rho v, I'll write this out in a little bit of a longer form so that we can be quite clear which density it is. this is. This is density of the whole of all catalysts in the reactor. Or in other words, we could write this as kilograms of catalyst <coughs> per meter cube of occupied volume in the reactor. Which for the most part, that is the total volume of the reactor. The catalyst is usually made to fill up the entire reactor, so that's the volume of the reactor usually in the demand. If provided that's, that's true. Now this was all good and well last class for a single reaction system. <coughs> the question now is what happens if there's multiple reactions taking place? So a very small modification takes place. Only the modification takes place here to so this first term that generates. This is the heat released or heat released by the reaction for a single reaction. If we have more than one reaction taking place, we have a term like this appearing for every reaction. So if I have two reactions taking place, I'll have a rate for the first reaction multiplied by its corresponding heat, and I'll have a second term summed up in this numerator for the second reaction's rate multiplied by its heat release. So that's the only enhancement for multiple reaction systems. Of course, we have to go make it look more complicated than it is over there, so we write the following to make it look like it. So, I will also emphasize here that I'm moving to dt by dw, just to substitute in that row e term. We could write this as Write this as the summation from i equals 1 to q of minus r i j multiplied by the heat of reaction i j and function temperature. surface area per unit volume times T minus TA and divided by rho and then in the denominator we have our regular flow terms FJ times CPG the J goes from 1 to N Okay, so we've gone and taken this guy and made it look more complicated than it really is. All that it says there on the board on the right is that we have one of these terms for every reaction occurring. So in terms of nomenclature here, phi is equal to 1, 2, up to q, and that's my counter for the reaction. So if I have five reactions, I'll have five terms over here. But I, or five 
components that make up that summation. J then is my counter for the species. So one, two, up to n species. So my denominator here in particular, the summation is got one flow term for every species multiplied by the decomposition. Now, there is an important point here to, to be made, and that is checking your consistency of your units. Let's take a look at this rate of reaction multiplied by the heat of reaction, and just break it down for one entry in that summation. So, Rij multiplied by minus delta hr. Let's just take a look at the units of that and the interpretation of those. This first term is the moles of J in reaction I. So I is the counter that I use for first, second, third, up to the Q reaction. J is the counter for the species, so it's the moles of J in the reaction I divided by units cube of reactor per unit time, usually seconds. Okay, so that's, we're just doing an analysis here of the units. The heat of reaction is joules Reaction I divided by the moles of J reacted in reaction I. Write that then for every one of the basis species. So if in reaction one my basis is A, I will have minus RA, and then the heat of reaction will be the joules released from that reaction per mole of A reacted in the reaction. In my second equation, maybe species D is my basis. That will be then the second term of the summation will be moles of D in the second reaction per meter cubed seconds multiplied by the heat released from the second reaction per moles of D reacted in reaction two. So you only have one term for every reaction in the summation. You only have Q terms in here. So if I have four reactions like you have in your course project, then you'll have four, four terms in the summation. So in your course project then, you'll have seven ODEs. You'll have five ODEs for flow, one ODE for temperature with respect to W, dt by dW, and one ODE for the pressure profile with respect to W. Several of you were a little confused about that in the tutorial this morning. So let's, let's understand that a bit more. So I'll end there. That's the last of the theory you need for this project. If you're comfortable with um, everything else in this course, um, that's, that there's nothing extra that's going to be covered tonight. The rest of what's going to cover tonight is just some recap of the important concepts I noticed were missing in the tutorial. The first one I want to, the first major concept I want to cover is the concept of which ODE should appear in the system. So, this is a packed bed reactor. Packed bed reactor we are integrating from our entry point to our exit, and my coordinate system is W equals zero to W is capital W. So that's my independent variable. Now, my dependent variable, Variables, I should say, are those 
that change as we go from the entry point to the exit of the reactor. So my dependent variables then are all the terms that change from entry to exit. And we had said in the section on multiple reactions that the very first step in solving this problem, so this is the very first step in that plan, the plan section, the critical plan step that we almost always like to rush over as engineers. I do it myself. I'll be the first to admit that I don't often plan my strategy. I just dive in and start writing code because I like that. Or I just start plugging in numbers into equations because I feel that's satisfying and I'm going to get to a solution quicker. But then usually I end up making a mistake. I have to come back and figure out what's going wrong. And I have to end up planning anyway. And so I end up doing doubles in my head. But the first step in plan was to write out the design equation for a packed bed reactor, which is the F by the W is RA. If we're only dealing with species A, it would be DFA, EW, RA. Or if we're dealing with multiple species, we take that away and we use our subscript J instead. So my independent variable is W. My dependent variable divided by WR moles per second per unit kilograms, which is W. What are your rates being expressed in? Your rates, whatever's on the other side here, must get you units that are exactly consistent with those. Okay? And you're, you're likely going to find that your rates here are not in terms of kilograms, but they're in terms of volume. So you need to make a, a conversion there to get that consistency. Those are the, that's for the five ODEs related to flow. For the ODE related to temperature, you have dt by dw. You must make sure that on the right hand side of that expression, you get units at the end which come out to be Kelvin per kilogram. So when you multiply out your rates, make sure your rates are in the appropriate units, multiplied by heat of reaction, and then when divided by rho V, the capital density, you get a set of units. Whatever units you get here in this first term, 
the units in the second term must be consistent, otherwise you cannot make the subtraction. So make sure that your units of U times A times temperature divided by rho get your units that are consistent with this first term in the summation. Once those are consistent and you do the subtraction, then divide through by the denominator, and then once those units cancel out, you should be left with units that are Kelvin per kilogram. If you've not got a mistake in your code, guaranteed you've going to divide by rho B, or your units of A here are inconsistent in some way. Okay, so let's just recall that units for A are meters squared per meter cubed. So the surface area exposed on the tube per volumetric, uh, per unit area of volume in the tube. And then your final ODE dy by dw, dy by dw, this must have units of 1 over kilograms. So y is dimensionless, so the units must be 1 over kilograms. So that's some, some guidance. A number of you in your code today have seen you were having units that were not consistent and that was leading to you getting the code files that uh, led, led to the software giving garbage out. The next issue that comes up is the issue related to the number of tubes to use in the shell and tube heat exchange. So this is not just a plug flow reactor where we've got a single tube running with ambient temperature outside it, TA. That TA, outside this tube, we've got water. This is a shell and tube heat exchanger where on the shell side, we've got water that we're converting over to steam using this heat being released from the reactor, if possible. We don't know if we go to steam, but it's certainly we've got water on the shell side at a fixed temperature TA. On the tube side, we've got our reaction happening. That needs to be contained inside the shell and tube heat exchanger. So a number of you are asking, well, how do I know how many tubes to use? Can you use one tube? No. No? Why? almost two kilometers. Okay, it will always be two kilometers long, but low density polyethylene LDPE is made of the in this case to take care What else, what are you going to hit in first? What's the problem you're going to hit up to first if you had a reactor two kilometers long? Pressure drop. So that's the key variable in this case. <coughs> After a very short distance, a few meters, your pressure inlet P0 is quickly going to get down to zero and you're not going to be able to move the material through the reactor at all. So for that reason alone, you cannot have a single tube. How many tubes do you need? Well, if you go, if you now have two tubes, you have half the length, and you can go a and you can maybe make it. If you go four tubes, eight tubes, or any number, of higher number of tubes, you'll eventually get to a point where this reaction will start to work. But if it's running in a shell and tube heat exchanger, you're not going to make the shell and tube heat exchanger in your company. You're going to phone up a supplier and say, sell me a heat exchanger with 3.8 centimeter diameter tubes, and I need X number of tubes. Well, how many tubes do you ask for? Depends on the manufacturer, for sure. Most shell and tube heat exchangers are made according to catalogs, so you can purchase them in fixed configurations, but many companies will also custom make them. Isn't that much more expensive? Not too much more, because the fabrication cost on their side is still exists. So one way to judge these open-ended problems are to just look up pictures of shell and tube heat exchanges. Right? You guys are in a far more fortunate position than I was when I was an undergraduate in the late 1990s. We we didn't have internet, yes, but we didn't have Flickr, and we didn't have Google Images, and we didn't actually even have Google. Do you believe? So, make use of it. There's a shell and heat exchanger that's been custom manufactured for a company. 
That gives you a good estimate of the size and the diameter. How many tubes can you fit into that shell and tube heat exchanger? A lot. What's the length of that heat exchanger? Here's a guy. Let's say he's one and a half, one point seven meters tall. So we can put like ten copies of him side by side. That's about seventeen to twenty meters. Okay. Let's take another look at it at a heat exchanger. There's the face plate. The entry face plates. So your flow of 300 volts per second is coming along, and then how does it get distributed? Just evenly through all the pipes. Every pipe gets one or 300 volts per second divided by the number of tubes of flow going into it. So when you in MATLAB are integrating your profile, you're not going to integrate the profile of 300 tubes. You're going to only integrate the profile for one tube. Inside one tube, you're going to have seven ODEs going. So there's no need to integrate the seven ODEs for every tube. If you do it for one tube, you've done it for all the tubes. The only thing you must take into account is that your flow coming in now gets evenly split across the space plate through the tubes. So there's your tubes going. On the shell side, we've got water here. There's a cloth enclosure over here that's not shot. It's being taken out so that this photo can be taken. But this face plate shows very clearly how the material will get evenly distributed through the tubes. The, here's another example of a, of a technician creating a face plate. So that gives you a good idea of the diameter. What would be this diameter? <laughs> so, no, that's right. That's fine. I mean, how many tubes inside that diameter? <laughs> so, how would you figure it out? How would you calculate it? Here's, a, here's an unusual heat exchanger. Here's an unusual heat exchanger because the tubes are right next to each other with no particular spacing in between. Let's go back to the original picture with the face plate. There was dead space. Okay, so there's a lot of dead space in, in this region. With this particular heat exchanger, there's no dead space. Every tube is used. But it's clear then that there's not heat exchange with the earth, with the surrounding it outside. This would be an example of a packet where there's no requirement for heat exchange. But if they pack it so that they can easily uh, separate out individual channels and replace catalyst individually. Here's another example of the shell and tube heat exchanger, giving you an idea of diameter and length. There's an example of how the face plate is getting manufactured. So it's just done by a, a drilling or a boring machine. There's an example of a finished face plate. And there's an example of a dirty heat exchanger that periodically needs maintenance to clean it out. So you've got, you got quite a good idea of hole pitch. Here you can see the holes are pitched uh, in a grid or wise fashion. Sometimes they'll pitch the holes on a diagonal. These are pitched vertically. So you can quickly calculate the number of tubes in a typical size heat exchanger to get an estimate of, of your flows. So the main issue here is you cannot have one tube because you will not be able to operate it with the pressure drop. The next issue that comes in was how many tubes is pretty easy to come up with a sensitive estimate of what the number of tubes need to be. The next issue that I'd like to talk about is the issue of this param idea in MATLAB. So I think many of you have, have got the concept figured out now. I posted the code on the course website for you to go through in your own time. That's, you will notice is going to be part of, you guys are now in your final end of third year. You're pretty much fourth year students to for all intents and purposes in my mind. When you start to get in fourth year, this is what happens. You post material, you're expected to go through it at your own time and, and learn how, how to use it. So it was quite surprising to me in today's tutorial when many of you still hadn't figured out exactly what this program was even though it's been on the course website for several days. Let's take a look at it so we can understand what's how to use it. When we integrate our ODEs, we've got two parts in that. We've got our driver on the outside, and we've got our model on the inside. 
Uh, it's illustrated as follows. So ODE driver script, I should say, that does the work of calling the integrator and of specifying the initial conditions. So it does initial conditions and calls the integrator. For a specific model. So the model is the piece of the code that's going to be integrated separately. In this case, the model is for a plug flow reactor. So what we, we have this driver on the outside that does that work. On the inside, called by the driver, we have another MATLAB function. In this case, I've called it PFR example. And it's the model. and it's going to be called once by ODE driver and it's going to return a certain amount of output. And then inside ODE driver you're going to plot the output or you're going to make calculations from it. So for example, the, out, the output is only going to give you the profiles of the reactor, but you might need to calculate the yield or calculate the selectivity. You're going to use that output coming from the model to make those calculations. Now, Paraz is a way to get parameters into this model file. So an example of that is I might have up here param dot t0 is equal to 423. That initial temperature of 423 Kelvin gets passed into this model. The model uses that number in some way to generate the output. I can also have another input. I don't, I'm not restricted to just one variable. In fact, that's why we use params, so that we can pass multiple variables in, in one container or one go. In my project file, I've got eight parameters right now that I'm passing into my model for my plug flow reactor. So rather than specifying eight different inputs, params dot whatever allows me just to have one variable with eight sub-variables connected to it. So param isn't a special MATLAB function. It's just a MATLAB variable. There's nothing special to it like any regular MATLAB variable. So a few of you are trying to Google what param is or what param does. It's not a MATLAB function at all. So, Let's take a look at that here and also introduce another thing that I, I've started to realize that uh, you, you're not quite aware of, but is super helpful when you're working with MATLAB code, and that's to use the debugger. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this, uh, this driver. There's my params, and I'm going to... I'm going to use that param and integrate my ODE with that T0 and FT0. These are two parameters I'm going to pass into my ODE integration step here. So the debugger in MATLAB is a way for you to figure out where things are going wrong in your code, or just simply to investigate what your code is doing. Um, you do you initiate the debugger by clicking on these minus signs next to the line number you wish to stop at. And when you debug, you, can st you start off the system by saying debug run, or just hit F5, or another way of doing it is to hit that green play button. Either one of those approaches will do the same thing. 
So when you hit that, the code will stop at that particular line that you put the red dot at. To investigate the variables, many of you I noticed go to MATLAB and you type param. Okay, and that works, that works fine. You see that that param t0 is 330 and ft0 is 4528. But you can also just hover your mouse over the param. You don't have to go backwards and forwards and, and flip, flip your windows around to get to that point. So that saves you a ton of time. So that shows me what the current value of param is right now. Let me go to my model. So this is the piece of code that's inside the, the code, and this is the model of the plug flow reactor. I can put a breakpoint here as well. So if I put a breakpoint there right at the very first line, and I now go out to debug and I say continue. So it will just continue running the code until it meets the next breakpoint. So continue on and it stops at the second breakpoint I've set. Now notice here this interior code has three variables coming in. PFR example, three inputs. The first one in-depth and the second one dependent. Those must be set in that order. MATLAB requires you to, to do that. Your first variable must be an independent scalar. The second variable will be a vector of dependent variables. The third input is this param. So that's how you get your parameters coming into this interior block of code over here, is through that third input. So if I now go hover my mouse over param up there, I'll see exactly the same values as I saw before because it's that same structure, that container of variables has just been sent to this inner piece of code that now goes and uses param. So here in the second line of the code, I have param of FTO is, is extracted out of that variable. So in my debug, I have to do the following. I say debug step, and it will step through your code line by line. So F10, line by line, will step through your code, and at any point, after that code has been executed, I can hover my mouse over the variable and I can see there that the value of 45.28 has been taken out of the parameter and assigned to this new variable here. So the debugger is a great way to step through your code line by line. Guarantee you will not write your model file correctly the first time. You're going to have to figure out where errors are. This is a great way to do it. The general approach is as follows. If you get a problem in your MATLAB file, set your debugger right at the bottom. Stop the code at the, deep, at the bottom. If that output, you'll, that output should clearly look unreasonable because the, there's a problem in the code. And then you work your way from the bottom up, trying to isolate where the code is. So for example, in this last line of code, D, D dependent by D independent. So in this particular example, that represents DX by DB is the negative rate divided by FA0. FA0 is a, is a constant, but let's say I saw a problem with minus RA. Well, what, how is minus RA calculated? Minus RA is calculated up here. I can see it's made up of two portions, R1A, R2A, and then I can go debug those individually. So I move up my code from bottom to the top to find where my problem is occurring. So that's the general strategy for debugging. You may not have seen that before, but a good number of you have, or if you've not, you, you, you've seen it, but just not used it yet to its full advantage. Okay, so the, the next thing I want to point out in your code is work with comments that clearly show your units. So here I've got my units set. If I'm multiplying variables together, calculate the product of your units and, and specify the units of those product variables or summation terms here as well, so that you can keep track of the consistency as you go from beginning to end of the code. The last thing I want to point out, and then I'll just have open question and answer here at the front, is there is a good example in Fogler that's not quite at the level of complexity of the course project, but would certainly be helpful for you to go through and see how the, how to set up the folder, and that is, if you've got the newer version of folder, example 12.5, or if 
got the older version of the result of x10. Now, I know a few of you are getting frustrated with this course project because you've, you've seen all these issues with MATLAB coming up and you're like, well, I'm taking chemical engineering, I'm not taking computer programming. What's, why, is, why is this contradiction happening? I will tell you the following. Every successful engineer I've seen working for the past 12, 15 years has been an adequate or good coder. Those that get passed on for promotion or get fired or get let go have no coding skills. Excel is not coding. So being able to use a spreadsheet is not going to be sufficient to survive in the workforce for the next 30 years. Every single engineering position I've seen has required coding of some sort. Okay, so I strongly, strongly recommend if this is not something you're comfortable with, that you learn, go back to your first year 1D notes, take extra courses outside of regular classes, or when you graduate, take courses to make sure you can keep up with this. This is a critical skill to have, especially in chemical engineering. Other engineering professions have a great amount of experimental work that can go to, to figure things out. As chemical engineers, our systems are beyond the level of complexity that we can build experimental setups for. We have to resort to simulation and coding to figure, figure those problems out. So that is a strong, strong suggestion, and it's one reason why you will see in many of these courses from, the, from about this point onwards that a lot of computer skills are required. For this course, you may be tempted to use Aspen. I will tell you now that that will not be acceptable, only because this is a reactor design course, you need to prove that you can design the reactor. Aspen, in fact, will not even work for this particular situation because you cannot put some of these equations into Aspen to integrate these profiles. And the optimization steps will, are, are going to be cumbersome in Aspen. So, so let's not try to do that for this particular course project. The final thing that just occurred to me before I, I may not even have time for questions, but I certainly will stay around for questions afterwards, is how do, why do I use this parameter and how do I use it to make, um, find an option? So let's just, uh, let's go to the debugger here and just stop it, stop it right now, or just let it run to completion, exit debug mode. Let me go back to my ODE driver. Here I've integrated my ODE with this line ODE45, and I've integrated a single time at this particular temperature and at that particular flow. The question that came up in the tutorial this morning is, well, why don't you just put that variable into your model over here, into PFR example? So why specify outside if all that this thing is doing is taking it from the outside and putting it inside anyway? Why don't I just put it inside anyway and, and end up end there? That would be fine if you were only integrating this only a single time. But we're not. One of the key issues we have to do in this project is find an optimal temperature and an optimal pressure at which to operate this reactor. In this example I've got up on the slide on the, on the computer right now, there is only one variable that affects the process, it's temperature. So I'll demonstrate for you the approach with a single variable. In your case, you would take it and just extend it to the two variable case. So you proceed as follows. If that's my ODE integrator, I will just put it inside a for loop for t is equal to 200 to 300, I think it was in the example. 300 to 400. So 300 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. And close the loop there. So this is going to call the ODE integrator 101 times at temperature 300, 301, 302, up to temperature 400. But I haven't told the ODE on the inside how that inlet temperature gets there. So what I do then is take this param out over here and bring it inside the loop and set param t0 equal to t0. So t over here is going to be changing at every iteration, 300, 301, 302, and so forth. That's not quite solving the issue yet. 
all this will do is it will run the, the model for me 301 times at those three, at, uh, sorry, 101 times between temperature 300 and 400. But it will not do anything else for me. I need to record the output from this from this ODE. And in particular, I need to calculate something useful from that. So right now, every time I run the ODE, I'm going to get the profile coming out here through the reactor. But that's not really what I want. What I want in this particular case is I want a summary of that profile. And in this particular example, what's the most useful summary for me is the value of that dependent variable at the end of the reactor. So let's, uh, let's run this code up to this point and I'll show you then how to do that interactively. So we run the code, ODE45. Notice now param coming in has a value of temperature 300. If I step over that code and I come into the interior model, so this is the inner model, I can see param has that value of 300 carried to the inside. Let it run to the end. And now that ODE has been integrated between from the entry point of the reactor to the exit using a inlet temperature of 300. My dependent variable in this particular example, if I plot it, that could be the profile of the dependent variable from the inlet of the reactor to the exit of the reactor. What I'm interested in this particular example is that final point. I'm not really interested in the entire profile. This is a profile actually of conversion. So what I'm really interested in this example is the conversion at the exit of the reactor. For most of our examples that we work with, we are only interested in the conditions at the exit of the reactor. Like we're not so concerned about what goes on in the middle, what we are interested in is what's leaving at the end. So what I need to do is I need to capture that value at the end of the reactor. So I can say that conversion at exit is equal to dependent and I need the last value in that vector. That vector has going to, is going to have a different number of rows every time. So MATLAB has a rate function called end, which will get you the last entry from that vector. So end comma one. The reason why I put comma one is because in some of the models, I may have two or three columns. In this case, I know my conversion is going to be the first column coming out. So I want the last row from the first column. Now conversion at exit is going to be assigned that value, but it's going to get overwritten with every iteration. So at iteration 300 Kelvin, then it's going to go to 301. So that value can get overwritten. So what I need to do is pre-allocate a vector up here to store the values ahead of time. So conversion at exit is equal to a vector of zeros. We're going to have 101 entries in there by the end of it. So create this 101 entry vector and let's store that conversion at exit. I can then add a loop counter here. I is, let's put it here. I is equal to 1. And I want to store conversion at exit in the i location. And then I need to update my loop counter. I equals i plus 1. There are slightly more efficient ways of doing what I've just done up here. But conceptually, you'll get a good, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an empty vector, store the conversion at the exit for the 101 temperatures that I'm simulating. So i equals 1, and then it's going to update the counter and store that and create a vector for me with the conversions. Let's take a look at that, right? So there's no need to run your code and hope for the best. We actually just simply save our code, and let's just run it again with the debugger. If I use the debugger now, I step through my code, F10, F10. I've just executed that line of code. There's my vector dependent. I can do the following. If I highlight that code, dependent N1, I can right click it, and there's this entry in the menu that evaluates selection for F9. We'll basically copy and paste that into MATLAB at the command line as if you typed it by hand. So F9, now if I go over to MATLAB, I will see the, the result of that. So it's telling me the conversion at the exit of the reactor was 14%. And it's going to store it in this vector of zeros in the i location, i is equal to 1. So if I hit F10 and run that line, now conversion at exit contains that value. 
I plus one and I run it. And it, I'm happy that it's doing what, I, what I'm thinking. So there, the second time round, where the inner temperature is 301 Kelvin, now my exit conversion has bumped up. And I'm happy going a few times, run through that 10, 10, 10, 10, and it builds up my conversion vector. I'll take away my break point, and then I just let the code run to the end, and I now will have, I think I'll say, front 300. Conversion and exit. And I'll get a plot now. I'll get a plot of that conversion as temperature changes, allowing me to very quickly find the optimum peak temperature, which corresponds to about 323 Kelvin in this case. Okay, so this is the case for one variable. In your example, for the project, you'd be iterating over two variables. So you're creating a two-dimensional grid, and then you would use the mesh function in that lab find your optimum temperature and pressure. Okay, so I will pause this code on the course.